forces and fields first, we had electric forces and fields second, and then magnetic forces and fields third. We just went on to continue with gravitational and electric fields. Um, next year, you will do more with magnetic fields. So for gravitational forces and fields, we obviously start with gravitational force, which is our Newton's law of universal gravitation. Um, we very quickly went into gravitational field, which is defined as the force per unit mass acting on a small test mass. Right, but then often we did have to derive, no, we didn't have to derive anything. Uh, in the data booklet, they tell us that gravitational field strength is force per unit mass. Um, sometimes we, we, we might find it more convenient to substitute this and for this force, <coughs> I'll end up with GM over R squared, where the big M is the thing that's creating the field, and the R is how far we are from the center of that. Uh, the field strength at a surface of a planet, then, would just be, we would use the mass of the planet, and then the radius of the planet down there. Uh, 6.2 was ex extremely analogous to 6.1, so our basis for, for this was the electrostatic force, or the chrome force. So very similar to our law of universal gravitation, we just have different constants and Q's instead of M's. Um, electric field strength is defined as the force per unit charge acting on a small positive test charge. And similarly, we can derive an expression for that, which would end up being KQ over R squared. Uh, we did address the gravitational field and electric field patterns, and we just revisited those. So I don't think we need to review 6.3 then was our first and so far only look at magnetic forces and fields. Um, probably the, the key point in that subtopic is that the only thing that creates magnetic fields is moving charges. All right? So we obviously have uh, current carrying wires produce magnetic fields because current carrying wires have charges moving through them. And we had a number of different right hand rules that we used for things in this subtopic. So the first right-hand rule was the one that allowed us to determine the direction of the magnetic field around these current-carrying wires. And the way that the first right-hand rule worked was we wrapped our right hand around the wire, but we had to do it so that our thumb pointed in the direction that the current was traveling. Right? So we do have circular field lines around our wire, <coughs> but we can label those circles as clockwise or counterclockwise by using that first right-hand. Uh, we had a second right-hand rule that allowed us to find the direction of the magnetic force uh, on moving charges or on a wire. And the way that that one worked was we pointed our hand in the direction of the magnetic field. So if we have the Earth's magnetic field, it kind of pointed that way. Right, so our right hand points there. And then we pointed our thumb in the direction that the positive charge is moving. Right? So if our charge is moving up towards the ceiling, our thumb points up and then our palm points in the direction of the force due to that field that's acting on the charge. If we had a negative charge, then the force would just be the exact opposite direction, so it would be like the direction that the back of our hand points. Same thing with the wire. Uh, the only thing with the wire is we do just uh, pretend that, well, the, the current is positive charges. Uh, or at least conventional current is positive charges. So when we use the second right angle, the exact same way with the wire, we just make sure that we pretend that it's positive charges. All right, any other issues with uh, gravitational, electric, or magnetic forces and fields? Yeah. Um, so for the second right angle, the yes. direction of the positive charges, is the same thing with the direction of the current? The du yes. Yes, the direction of the conventional current is, is going through the wire is the same thing as the, the direction of the velocity vector of the positive charges, absolutely. All right, then we have topic seven, which was our first and so far only look at nuclear physics, uh, although it's called atomic in nuclear physics, because we did actually do a tiny bit with electrons in that topic. Uh, topic 7.1 was on the atom. Uh, that was a pretty short one. And then 7.2 was on radioactive decay. 7.3 was on uh, nuclear reactions. So as far as the atom, we kind of started things off by evaluating this geiger marsden experiment, which we sometimes call the Rutherford-Gold-Oil experiment. And 
uh, they shot alpha particles at the gold coil and found that most of the alpha particles went straight through. A few of them did change directions slightly, and a very, very, very few of them changed directions tremendously. So the importance of that experiment was that it told us that all of the positive charge in an atom is located in a very, 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 very small space, and we do have a very large charge density there. Um, so <coughs> we went on to look at some evidence for electron energy levels. We call them atomic energy levels to just kind of separate out that this is not a nuclear thing. And our evidence for that was these emission spectra or these absorption spectra. So for hydrogen, which we have here, I think maybe Jordan can't see that, I think most of you can. Um, as an electron in the hydrogen atom jumps from a higher energy level state to a lower energy level state, it has to get <coughs> a photon right, in order to release that energy. So there are only a few frequencies of photons that can be given off, which represent that you know, relatively few number of energy level jumps that the hydrogen electron can make. And then we did meet the strong nuclear force for the first time. Um, so if we're looking at our protons and neutrons, we know that the protons are repelling each other super, super, super strongly. Well, maybe super strongly because they're positive. Um, and we have the strong nuclear force, which is attractive. Um, and that's true that we have strong nuclear force for protons and protons, for neutrons and neutrons, or for protons and neutrons. But it's only strong if, they're, if the nucleons are like next door neighbors. Right? So we did meet the strong nuclear force for the first time. We then went on to discuss radioactive decay. Um, we did say that radioactive decay is spontaneous and that you know, it just happens. There's not like a sequence of steps that leads up to it happening. It does just happen. And random in that there's, there's no way we did it. this nuclei has the exact same probability of as this other nuclei of occurring. Uh, we have three main types of radioactive decay, alpha, beta, and gamma definitely want to know the, the proton and number and mass number of, the, of each of those three things. Right? So our alpha particle is the same thing as a helium nucleus. It has a charge of two and a mass of four atomic mass units. Our beta particle is an electron, so it has a mass of zero uh, atomic mass units, or close to zero, and a charge of negative one. And then our gamma is just radiation. It's not a particle. So it has uh, both a mass number and a charge number of zero. We also did encounter a positron decay. But um, that should not show up on any SL question. And I shouldn't have included that on your exam. Uh, we also want to remember that the anti-neutrino uh, is, is also produced when we do beta. Uh, we also dealt with half-life in topic seven. So half-life was the time it takes for the radio radioactivity to decrease by one half. Um, we should be able to find half-life from a decay curve, but we also should be able to solve half-life problems. And the way that I typically do that is by just producing a table to help me track things. So my table um, typically has like percent of nuclei or something like that as one column. Um, half lives that have passed as another column and then like, time as the final column. And the one thing to, to really be careful of here is that when we are starting, right, when you're saying, all right, paying attention now, so whoever's present, like, <coughs> you're all taking care of you're, you're representing 100% of our sample. It has to happen at a time of zero, and that also happens at zero half-life. Do not start at one half-life. At one half-life, we should have half of our, of our parent nuclei remaining. Right? So we just go down until we find whatever the heck it is that we're <coughs> And then finally, we had topic 7.3, which was on our nuclear reactions, including fission and fusion. Um, so we did uh, talk quite a bit about mass defect and binding energy. So mass defect is like the difference in mass between our assembled nucleus and then our pulled apart individual nucleons. Remember when we pluck those nucleons out of the nucleus, uh, when we give them mass, right? the energy that we spent to pull them out uh, changes into extra mass. 
And then finding energy gives that total energy required to totally pluck all of those nucleons out of the nucleus. And we can relate those two things by using um, our, our Einstein mass energy equivalency statement, where we would just consider this the binding energy, and the mass would be the mass defect. Uh, and we did have some clever units, like a clever unit of mass for this, so m v per c squared is a very clever unit for that, because if that is our unit for mass, then the energy will end up just being the same as the mass in mega electron volts instead of m v per c squared. Uh, we looked at some graphs. Uh, well, we talked about binding energy for nucleon. Binding energy for nucleon is just the total binding energy divided by whatever many nucleons we have. And we did have that graph which tracked the binding energy for nucleon as a function of, uh, what is it? I think it was a function of mass number. And it kind of looked like this, but we did have that kind of weird spike. Who was that weird spike for? Helium? Or it was for our alpha particle. Yeah, helium 4. Right, it's for our alpha particle. Uh, two protons and two neutrons is just like a super stable or, uh, arrangement. And then who is up here? Uh, no, not your lead. It's like iron. It's like iron or nickel. Yeah. Like iron or nickel, right? So anybody smaller than iron or nickel um, is is less stable. Anybody larger than iron or nickel is less stable, also. And the jump over here would get more stable by doing fusion, or by getting larger. And the jump over here would get more stable by doing fission, by getting smaller. Uh, and, and actually, that, that was our final thing. And where does fusion happen? The sun. The sun, right. so the sun does fusion. And where does fusion happen? Yeah. Nuclear power plants, right? Some nuclear weapons. Yeah. When things fission, are they more likely to split into iron? Uh, more likely to split into iron. What's fissioning? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, know. I don't have an immediate answer to that. Other issues involving topic seven, creeping up on our kind of new transition to getting ready for those things. So then we had topic eight, which was a big, right? So uh, you know you definitely <coughs> want to gear your final preparations towards the topics that will have more questions in them, and that's topic two and topic eight. And then also topic nine, since we said we're going to more heavily weight um, topic nine for the exam. Topic eight is definitely something <coughs> that you should be looking at, especially because it's just kind of uh, a lot more kind of facts in there than in our typical topic. And we actually had a bunch of different subtopics, six of them. So first we had energy degradation and power generation. Uh, one of our first topics involved degraded energy, which just means energy that's in a less usable form. And we kept track of that by doing those Sankey diagrams, <coughs> where the width of the arrow was proportional to the amount of um, energy. Uh, we also encountered our generator, uh, which IV sometimes calls a dynamo um, for the first time. And our generator is just something that moves um, a magnetic field in the presence of wires, or moves wires in the presence of a magnetic field, and induces a current in those wires. So all of our power plants um, have a generator, and then you know, generators, motors are in lots of other applications as well. Uh, the next subtopic had us talking about the ways in which we do produce energy. So we did look at um, you know, both for the entire world, and then by a few other places, we looked at the energy makeup. And we found that like over 80% of the energy comes from what? Fossil fuels. Over 80% comes from fossil fuels. Maybe 20% you know, natural gas, 30% coal, 30% oil, something. <coughs> uh, and then nuclear was significant, hydroelectric was significant. Those were both like about 6% of electricity, maybe a little more for total energy. And really nothing else was significant. Nothing else was like 1%. Uh, we did discuss the difference between renewable and non-renewable energy sources. Uh, what is uranium? Non-renewable, non right? Because we cannot replenish it at the same rate that we consume. Uh, we did calculations involving energy density. So energy density is the energy stored per unit mass in a fuel, or the energy that can be released per unit mass of a fuel. 
And who has the biggest energy density? Uranium. Uranium. Uh, uranium is number two. Plutonium? No. Natural gas. Uh, uh, no. uh, right. So like high deuterium, tritium, uh, we're, we're almost a full order of magnitude larger than fission. But then you know, fission is five orders, five, six orders of magnitude greater than anything else. Um, out of our fossil fuels, what have the biggest energy density? Natural <laughs> gas, right, then oil, then coal. So coal has the worst energy density out of our kind of normal demand. Well, hydroelectric is uh, Still used, right. And then we definitely, you know, have, have been asked lots of times to cite advantages and disadvantages of the various sources. All right, so topic 8.3 was then honing in further into fossil fuel power generation. So uh, we did do some calculations involving energy density to find out like how much mass uh, we had to burn each day to produce a given amount of energy or the rate at which we had to consume the fuel. Uh, we needed to know efficiencies of our different uh, fossil fuel power generating stations. So natural gas is more efficient than the others, or maybe typically around 40-ish percent efficient for a natural gas plant. Coal is probably closer to 30 or 25 percent, right? But they're all relatively close. Uh, we definitely want to be able to to talk about the parts of power plants. We want to know what the turbines do and what the what the generator is, what is driving the turbines, um, and then we did spend some time talking about some of the environmental uh, problems associated with using fossil fuels. Topic 8.4 is in a pretty slow look at all of our non-fossil fuel based power production. So we started off with nuclear power. Right? Remember nuclear power is just fissioning so far. We do not do fusion for power. Uh, the isotope that is fissionable that we use at least in this country is uranium-235. Uh, in addition, to the turbine and generator and heat exchanger and all that good stuff we had for fossil fuel burning plants. We had some other important aspects of nuclear plants we had. Uh, we need a moderator. The job of the moderator is to take those neutrons that are produced in the fission reaction and slow them the heck down so that they have a reasonable chance of inducing another fission if they hit the uranium-235. The control rods are the things that we use to stop some of the neutrons so that we don't have too many visions uh, happening at once. Uh, we do want to remember that we do use the same fuel for nuclear weapons as we do <coughs> for nuclear power. It just has a higher level of enrichment for nuclear power. In fossil fuel, in fission power plants, the uranium fuel is probably only about 3% uranium-235. For nuclear weapons, that point to the wrong one. For nuclear weapons, it's probably more like 80 to 90 percent uranium 235. Oh, we then went on to look at solar power. We had two different types of solar power. We had solar photovoltaic, where uh, light was directly converted into electricity. And then we had solar heat, uh, where we are converting light into thermal energy. Uh, we looked at hydroelectric power, right? So we had a few different styles of hydroelectric power. We had water that we were storing in lakes. We had water that was already in a river that we could utilize. We had tidal water that we could utilize. And we also had that weird pump storage thing where at night, when we don't need much electricity, we could spend energy to pump water up to a higher reservoir so we could get it back in the lower reservoir uh, when we need it. So that, that, that would be a pretty easy thing to do with lakes or even with tidal or the river. I don't think we could really do that. Uh, we looked at wind power as well, where we're taking kinetic energy from the air molecules and using that to spin our turbine. And we had wave power, and the only type of wave power that we were responsible for knowing about was our oscillating water column, ocean wave energy converter, where we had a column of water, not necessarily vertically, we had a column of water going up and down, and we were using that water to push on air, to push that air through. Uh, and then we went on to our um, climate physics subtopic. So we uh, met albedo, which is the ratio of scattered radiation to incident radiation, or reflected is the way I prefer to think about it, reflected to incident. Uh, things that reflect lots of light then have pretty high albedos, close to one. 
things that don't reflect much light and have low albedos close to zero. Uh, greenhouse effect is a big, 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 big deal that has a lot of points, right? So the sun emits uh, short wavelength radiation. That radiation can pretty much make it all the way through the atmosphere without um, getting absorbed by anybody. Uh, the Earth absorbs that short wavelength stuff, and because we are way colder than the sun, right, our radiation spectrum is shifted towards longer wavelength. So the Earth re-emits that stuff at longer wavelength, and then our greenhouse gas molecules can absorb that long wavelength radiation and then re-emit in, in all directions, including back to Earth. So the greenhouse effect nets extra radiation being incident on the Earth. And our greenhouse gas molecules were CO2 and N2O and CH4 and uh, water vapor. We did look at absorption graphs of our greenhouse gas molecules, and we saw that, yes, in fact, they did absorb frequencies that correspond with infrared. Uh, we then went on to look at black body radiation. So we had this Stefan Boltzmann law, which could quantify for us uh, how much radiative power uh, an object does. Sometimes we use an emissivity term in there if our object is not a perfect black body. Uh, and then we did, again, have these uh, curves of wavelength as a function of, uh, of intensity or power or whatever. Uh, we did have that kind of uh, di distribution where we had a peak wavelength that was a function of the temperature of the object. Uh, so we already mentioned emissivity, and then we did spend uh, a day using an energy balance climate model where we assumed that the energy coming in to the Earth was equal to the energy going out. And then finally, in topic eight, we had our kind of like prologue to, to climate change, where we were looking at the evidence that climate change is in fact due to humans. Uh, and we definitely say that there, uh, well, there are reasons that the Earth can and has warmed, uh, you know, having nothing to do with, with greenhouse effect. We can have volcanic activity, we could have changes in the Earth's orbit, we can have changes in the sun's radiative power output, but also greenhouse gas concentrations. And the enhanced greenhouse effect is us acknowledging that increased greenhouse gas concentrations due to human activities, mainly fossil fuel burning, um, has caused the, t the surface temperature, the atmospheric temperature of the Earth to go up. And then we also took a, a brief uh, detour and looked at volume expansion due to temperature reasons in, in reference to sea level. All right, so that was kind of topic eight in a nutshell. Um, if you do have follow-up questions with topic eight, then I'll, I'll let you kind of do that individually um, so we can work on, on getting ready for our next exam. So now if you could stop recording,